Hello and welcome to Thinking Critically, a D&D discussion, a podcast where we deep dive single word concepts or ideas within the Dungeons and Dragons 5e framework. My name is Danilo and I like all kinds of games and the crunchy mechanics that make him tick. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and I'd really appreciate a like or a follow. Today I am joined by Cal aka The Baron. Thank you so so much for joining us today Cal. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, well yeah I'm The Cal. I go by The Baron on YouTube, Twitter, uh, Instagram, things like that. Uh, loads of people always ask me why The Baron it actually goes back to uh, I used to be a sort of semi-professional juggler back in college <laughs> and the name just kind of stuck so there are genuinely people out there who only know me as the baron so it was just easier than going by cal the dungeon master or cal the gm <laughs> that that's a really unique name i'm glad you saved that one for the recording rather than telling me beforehand because that's <laughs> that's really cool thank you very much for joining us today i'm really looking forward to this one because it's a it's a pretty pretty interesting topic uh mm -hmm. there's a lot of heft to it today's topic is health so what does that mean to you well it's got a kind of dual thing within the ttrpg community actually because when we were talking i actually mentioned that i'm a trainee nursing associate at the moment so mm -hmm. i'm actually training to be a nurse uh in the long term and Hilariously, I started doing my training right at the start of COVID, so <laughs> clearly something happened there. But otherwise, in terms of actual health, weirdly enough, I mainline healer classes in mm. almost every role-playing game I play. I mean, if I play a character, I'm usually going to be... If I'm playing d and I'll usually play a cleric mm -hmm. or a ranger who obviously get a few healing abilities as well. Mm-hmm. So health is like a really big thing because whenever I'm building a character, my first thought is, oh God, which of my friends are going to die first and how do I stop that? Mm -hmm. And that tends to be my jumping off point with a lot of my characters. It's only been recently I've gone, you know what, they can all just, they, they've come to rely on me too much. One of them can do it for once. I'm going to play a rogue. <laughs> Treat yourself, mate. Yeah, have the night off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, do, I do like how... I never really realized it, but I, I do like how a lot of people have like go to archetypes mm. and a yeah, guy in my campaign and who I play board games with and he he's always like the barbarian y tanky yeah. kind of kind of person. There's another guy who wants to play like the kind of interesting off off tanks or off DPS classes always always and then the, the last guy is like pure glass cannon DPS. At any opportunity that's what he'll roll so it makes when we come to those class picking situations like almost one person can do it because they can just dole out the classes to the other ones because we'll know what they want to <laughs> yeah it sort of makes play. sense a bit easier like i know my wife she always used to play rogue whenever we played a game like whenever she mm -hmm. built up it was always an archer rogue every single time and it's only been recently she thought i'll try something else and now she's really stuck on warlocks and like uh, caster classes yep so it is nice having those archetypes that you just know you kind of like gravitate towards, but playing mm. outside of that, you kind of go, actually, this is what we're missing out on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, variety is the spice of life, as they Absolutely. say. As they say. So I'm going to open the the discussion then with a topic that I find really quite interesting and in a way unique to tabletop RPGs, or at least mm -hmm. uh, D and D. And please, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. So. I'm fairly certain it's described, or HP, or health points, however you want to talk about it, is described in the rules as not raw health, but more like fighting energy or fighting stamina. And Yeah, it's like how much you can take before you get dropped. Yeah, yeah, which I think is really... I think it can be a bit of a difficult mindset shift to kind of flip everything you've known till today on its head to mm. really kind of see it in that way. But then once you do a lot more things make a heck of a lot more sense <laughs> in, the, yeah. in the game. Because like, I was actually watching a video recently about um, house rules, and mm. that kind of thing came up because so many people use the house rule of called shots. Mm. Like, I aim for this limb or I aim for that. And then the main problem with that rule is everyone's just going to aim for the head. Yes. And I've played TTRPGs. D&D &D is actually one of my less played TTRPGs. Mm -hmm. And... A lot of the games I play have 
differing hit locations to different parts of the body. So the arm has its own hit points, the head has its own hit points, mm. that kind of thing. And in those mechanics, called shots work, but with D&D, because it's one block number of how much you can take, it doesn't really work. At least not the way you want it to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think in every game I've run, at least at one point, someone said, can I aim for the eyes to blind him? Yeah. It's bad. It's like taking the puppy out the back kind of thing. It's like, mm, I'm sorry, no. Mm. Because of a multitude of reasons we can't really get into now in the middle of no. combat. And they're just, they just they can't help but at that time feel a bit bummed out. But uh, I'm like, trust me, if you understood it, you'd, you'd be on my side. But <laughs> Yeah, if this was a game like, for example, Chaosium's Rune Quest, where the head has its own hit points and there are mechanics built into it for, uh, okay, you aim for the head, that will reduce your round in initiative and you'll minus 25% off your attack roll to mm-hmm. see if you hit, then you hit the head. Mm-hmm. That works, but with D&D, because it is that, like you said, it's that fighting spirit, it's that energy to keep going, Mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily work, because you've got a big bad evil guy who's, I mean, I know players love to ruin the big bad evil guy's monologue, (laughs) but ruining the monologue by decapitating him, (laughs) it's got a different feel to polymorphing him into a sheep, because that at least works within the mechanics. Yes. Yeah, I, on that note, I have planned probably about three years ahead of what I'm required to to ensure my bid bad evil guy gets their monologue. Like, I'm not oh, taking God, any same. anti-magic zone, <laughs> silence, like, the players ain't doing anything. He is, he is having his spiel. <laughs> I have made it in my campaign so that he will get his monologue so much that I actually turned the big bad one of the big bad evil guys of my Dungeons and Dragons 1E campaign that I'm running, Travis Lay Spark, into one of the player characters' grandfathers. <laughs> so like, she was adopted and then because of things that happened ma- really complicated, but basically I had to punish the rogue for something. Yeah. So I decided to punish him by making it so that the guy that he killed was actually the wizard's father, estranged biological uh-huh. father. Yep. And then it was like, you know what? That character is now the son of the big bad evil guy, so yep. the g- big bad evil guy is the grandfather of the wizard. Yes. And how that's that's some good motivation for the for the the big bad to be like, "Well, you killed my son, so mm. now I'm pissed." <laughs> line i love that i did drop on them was um oh i'm so sorry dear did i miss too many birthdays <laughs> and they thought i was being sarcastic i was genuinely playing the bad guy as genuinely concerned he'd missed his granddaughter's birthdays oh <laughs> <laughs> but oh that's cute yeah we gotta get our monologues <laughs> oh absolutely yeah yeah like Allow me that bit of railroading, please, guys. Mm. You, you've had you've had a hundred sessions of free form. Like you're giving me this. <laughs> please, please. I, I've rehearsed this in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Literally, it is. It's, it's get out of my head, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think all games masters do it. Doesn't matter what campaign you do, you do to an extent practice voices, or you at least practice getting into the mindset of certain NPCs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's so frustrating when the characters don't talk to that NPC. <laughs> Yeah. It's like I was yeah. ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, back on track then. Mm. Um, yeah. So as I said, like, I think it works in D&D. And again, I'm going to rely on your expertise of other TTRPGs here. But I think it works in D&D because there's so many other class abilities and features that play the part of affecting different body parts so you know fighters can disarm Hmm. there's other things to blind there's other things there's a i think the samurai fighter subclass can basically hamstring somebody so you reduce their speed aka attacking their legs essentially Hmm. so that's another reason why i don't like cooled shots in in dnd because it takes away uh, other characters special abilities exactly which again is a very difficult thing to articulate in the middle of combat especially to mm. newbies who are just like this is in isolation and there won't be any knock-on effects no actually yeah because once you set something as precedence then everyone's exactly. going to do it as well yeah yeah precisely yeah and it's like well no actually the guy after you was about to do that with a ability that consumes a thing and if you do it for free then we're, we're back into this Exactly, it's sticky situation here. As games masters and players never seem to understand, is 
it's our job to balance it. It's our job to make sure that everyone has a fair chance and everyone gets an opportunity to feel like a badass. Mm -hmm. Which is way more difficult than it sounds. (laughs) Yeah, I've got to say, balancing encounters so much easier than balancing the party. In terms of making the combat fair for everyone versus trying to keep power levels in parity. I, I know in my 5e campaign that I've got again that's on youtube i've had so many problems with um the sorcerer character and the barbarian getting way more kills than the Mm. paladin and the bard yeah and i've actually worked with the bard to actually help her feel a bit more productive in combat because she was hoping to be like the healer and the support and Mm -hmm. all this and then because the paladins then come in he's got his cure wounds and they're as good healers as each other yeah but now she's kind of gone more down the route of like dps and debuff Mm. yeah it is it is tricky i think we're we're digressing a little bit here but i do really Mm. like this discussion so i'm going to keep going in that what's again not immediately obvious and it's still you know i'm still learning now is that Mm. although the classes seem on paper very aligned and and balanced they do have different skill ceilings it is it, it is like different classes in, 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 a, in a video game, for example. So some are really easy to pick up, but the skill ceiling is is super high and, and some mm. are, you know, hard to pick up, but are very rewarding. And I think Bard is one of those ones that's a little bit trickier to really maximize the potential it out of really versus is. a barbarian. Yeah, mm. versus something like a barbarian who, if you just go default, 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 class options all the way down, you are kicking ass pretty soon but without as you said, a huge amount of thought. With Bard... There isn't a default. Mm. It's all over the place. I mean, the combination of jack of all trades and expertise. You can have an entire party of bards and have no two bards alike. Yes. Whereas you can have a party of barbarians and everyone's taken a different primal path. Mm-hmm. But they're going to effectively function the same. It's just that one's going to be a bit better at taking damage. That one's going to be a bit better at dealing damage. And the berserker is currently exhausted in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, precisely. I genuinely rolled up a barbarian berserker recently and realised how awful the class is. I oh, off no. it completely. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not one that's been too attractive to me. I have to admit, and it's it's probably because in the back of my head there was some a glaring problem. I'd like to think, but uh... yeah, well, raging you get to attack three times, and if you're taking the dual wheel feet, hey, that's attacking four times around, which is amazing. But the second you finish combat, you're exhausted. <laughs> Jiminy, right, yeah, I can imagine. You can accidentally kill yourself by level 12, because you can rage <laughs> five times, five points of exhaustion, dead, no death saves, done. <laughs> I like, and this is still on track, this is still talking about yeah. health, because obviously we're talking about dying here, so what, what I like about that is I've, in one of the campaigns I'm playing in, I'm playing a barbarian, path of the zealot, oh. and paladin, and they're kind of the opposite, like, he can't mm. die, because it's, if you're raging... You can't die, basically. Yeah. You still make death saves, but they don't take into effect until after you stop raging. Raging yeah. doesn't stop until you're knocked unconscious. Mm. So you've just got this feedback loop of, I can just keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going. And yes, I'm going to die after this. Yeah. But here's, here's, here's the trick, right? This is why I power gamed a little bit and taken a few levels in Paladin. is because oh, you've got yeah. Lay on Hands. And oh. Lay on Hands is, isn't a spell. So no. you can cast it while raging. So you can just be like, right, is is the threat over yet? Yeah. Dink, heal myself one HP. Let oh, rage that is end. Some clever min maxing. I like that. <laughs> I, I, I have always like had a go at people. Not had a go at people, but but called people out. Been ah, you cheeky little min maxer. And little did I realise that I was doing that all along. But um, the thing is, there's, there's kind of a difference though, because like someone who min maxes to the point where the character has no personality that's mm-hmm. bad but what you've just said there where you've taken a couple levels in paladin just to get the lay on hands and because you're a zealot anyway it makes sense exactly that you'd class into paladin exactly that that, that, was, that was my defense all along and, and obviously yeah. my my oath is i can't remember what it is off the top of my head but it aligns with the de that i'm a zealot for anyway so it's all it's all kind of again it's very similar it's flavored mm. you know i didn't really have to change my flavor at all it was like you're still a zealot barbarian it's just you're also getting some bits on the side yeah you're closer to the true religion that way yes because yeah. i always think because i've got in my party at the moment i've got a paladin and a barbarian of the ze- uh, barbarian zealot mm-hmm. i always kind of think like so clerics are directly in contact with their deity <laughs> yeah paladins speed are, dial. yeah paladins are a little bit in contact with their deity and i occasionally just throw random dreams of platinum dragons at the zealot because he's a zealot of bahamut 
Oh, wow. Okay. And I just let him interpret that as he will. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, flavor-wise, yeah. Exactly. Now, the player decided to take the dream of a load of metallic dragons at peace as, ah, I need to come out as gay to the party. (laughs) So that was down to the player. I I did nothing on that one. That was his interpretation. Okay, fine. Understood. (laughs) Yeah. It did cause a nice party banter in that. And actually going back to the health thing, actually on the zealot, one thing I did think, I love that zealots, if animate dead is cast on them, they just get Mm. revivified. Right, okay. Is so, that, uh, if you can uh, walk me through that, because I, my, my, I haven't played that character in a while, courtesy of. So I'll not just pull up Path of the Zealot really quick. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Get, while you're doing that, I can actually explain another thing I wanted to talk about. Is that I'm, I'm just gushing about my character now, but hey, oh, it's God, my podcast. Yeah, yeah uh, do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the other thing is, if you do, after all I described earlier, if you do eventually get killed, you can be mm. revived without material components. So people yeah. are dropping Revivify on you for free, essentially. Like, there you go, snap my fingers and you're back up again. No problem. <laughs> mm. So, yes, I'm I'm looking forward to going back to being this unending anger machine. Yeah. Righteous Fury. So, yeah, actually, sorry, that was me misinterpreting <laughs> the rule. That it's the Warrior of the Gods. It's you don't need the spell components to restore yes, your life, it. as with Ray's dead. Yes, yeah, that's it. Ah, there you go. Great minds. That's exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. So if you do get knocked down, it's a piece of cake to bring you back. Especially at lower levels as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hella, hella useful because... Mm. In in my campaign, a couple of the players have been knocked and, and they've had issues in the past where the clerics had to be like, guys, that has cost me 500 gold to bring you mm. back. Show some appreciation, please, that we could have spent on like health potions to stop it happening in the first place. Mm. Or just be careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, there is absolutely value in that. Oh, yeah. So t- talking of exhaustion, though, uh, hmm. we, we mentioned it there about the uh, Berserker Barbarian, and I'm um, going to jump on that as a segue. So, obviously, we've talked about HP as fighting energy, or fighting... I don't like stamina, because, again, that stamina implies it's, it's It'd be a something specific else. thing. Be, yeah. yeah, stamina would be close to, like, spell points. Uh, uh, almost, mm-hmm. like what, almost like the um, uh, superiority dice or bardic inspiration. That, I'd imagine, would be mm-hmm. stamina. Yes, that's a good way of thinking about it, yeah, for sure. So it's like willingness to fight, in a way. Mm. So exhaustion is kind of a, a sister to that, right? It's, 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 it's the same but different. So I wanted to, um, obviously you've got a Berserker Barbarian, and mm. obviously you can kick yourself at level 12 just by raging. I'm just yeah. raging so hard right now. So yeah, I just, I just wondered on your thoughts on exhaustion, how it, how it works with HP, you know, how much of a drawback it potentially is, and, and so on. I mean, with exhaustion at low levels, it's not too bad, because obviously, at first level exhaustion, you're rolling at disadvantage for all your ability checks and skill checks. Mm -hmm. But then by the time you hit three, you've got all the effects of those, and I think your maximum hit points are halved, Mm -hmm. and you're moving at half speed. So that barbarian berserker who relies on moving 40 feet per round Mm -hmm. and having the massive amount of hit points that a d12 hit dice allows them to have Mm. is now moving at 20 feet per round and has half the hit points they're used to just because they've been raging so often throughout the combat because the effects of rage don't negate the effects of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So I think when you've got like a character that's not really suffering exhaustion regularly, which most characters aren't going to unless they push themselves. Uh, I think the only class I can really think of besides Barbarian Berserker that's going to suffer exhaustion regularly is probably like a wizard who might have stayed up too late putting spells in their spell tome. Mm -hmm. And reading books. Exactly, yeah. Which is a massive aspect of the class. Mm -hmm. Which is quite a nice parallel between... The stereotypically yeah. more fighty frontline melee class and the more stereotypically book learned glass cannon back of the line class, they've actually got something in common, which is quite yeah. romantic in a certain way. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, I would love to have a game campaign where a barbarian falls in love with a wizard at some point over their mutual exhaustion while the cleric <laughs> is calling them both idiots. Yeah, they're both just knackered <laughs> all the time, and that's that's they meet in the middle, and yeah. that's their <laughs> ah wedding bells. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they're late because they're both so tired. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I don't really know many of the classes where exhaustion comes into the actual gameplay mechanics as much as 
what I'd say is those two, like with Barbarian Berserker, it's literally in the rules that they will suffer exhaustion for raging. Mm. And that's because they get that extra attack, which is a fantastic feature for a class that deals as much damage as a Barbarian does. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the one time I actually played a Berserker, I went with a um, Half-Orc Barbarian Berserker who was dual-wielding axes. Blimey. So you're getting four attacks off in a round while raging, then the bonus damage, every attack with advantage, because if you're playing a Barbarian, why aren't you attacking recklessly every turn if you need to? 100%, yeah. Because that just ups your chance of getting critical hits. Yep. I fully subscribe to the reckless attacks. In fact, I said to my dungeon master, from this point on, just assume I am. Just it's, assume it, it'll, it'll be the accept. It'll be the exception when mm. I don't attack recklessly, and that's when I'll tell you I'm not. But otherwise, always hit me with advantage, DM. I, from this point on, the ego carte blanche. I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. If I have a barbarian player, I'm just kind of assuming they're taking reckless attack because why wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> it would be like someone playing a fighter samurai and not giving themselves advantage. <laughs> Which I did... I actually mentioned that, because one of my party members mostly mainlines fighters and fighter subclasses, yeah. and he was saying, how can I get... Do I have to dual wield to get more attacks? Like, well, here's an option. Because samurai have that ability that allows them to just give themselves advantage. Yeah, for the rest of the round, yeah. Yeah, and then they have an ability at higher levels where if they have advantage on attack, they can actually make two separate attacks. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll pull it up just to make sure I'm right on that, but I worked out that if a samurai action surges, that's 16 attacks at level 20. (laughs) I knew fighters are already, like, bonkers, but that is is wild. I know. I only played a samurai to level 4, and yeah, I had that resource. It was quite limited at that level, but it was quite useful to combo it with action surge to say, okay, give me advantage, and then I get two attacks this turn, and then obviously that would have been a 3 yet level five exactly. which is completely just to give yourself advantage before you've attacked is pretty pretty tasty I know. and for fighters that's such a great ability mm. yeah here we go um rapid strike if you take an attack action on your turn and have advantage on the attack roll against one of the targets you can forgo the advantage of that roll to make an additional weapon attack oh wow against the target as part of the same action you can do so no more than once per turn. Okay, so you'd get a total of 10 attacks if you action surged. Yep. But that's still absurd, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that, and I really like that dynamic of consuming advantage to turn yeah. it into another hit. I'm not a mathematician. That that might be like mathematically silly to do that, mm-hmm. but I, I like it as, a, a, you know, as an interesting decision, at least at, at that point, to, exactly. to make the call. It's a fantastic one, especially if you're in a situation with a big bad evil guy you know has got like an absurd armor class. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, do I take advantage to increase my chance of hitting with one attack, or do I attack twice and hope that both of them hit? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, for for people who aren't human calculators like myself, that is just on the face of it a very interesting it is. decision. But yeah, that's the fifteenth level ability of Samurai Rapid Strike. Yeah, I really like the Samurai class. It's it is smart. a good class. Yeah, I'd like to re- revisit it at some point. Mm. So to- talking of exhaustion, just for a, a, a second, a guy Absolutely. in the campaign I'm playing in Dungeons Dice and Dudes, he is a funnily enough a half orc barbarian. Cool. And I think it's, it's, it is one exhaustion is one of those things we're talking about depending on the level you have it at, but it is one of those things that is, as always, context sensitive. And by that, in this instance, I mean kind of where you are in the adventure. So if you're doing like a beach episode or a shopping episode in the city, in your home city, then you know yeah. you might spend a week there, at which case that's seven long rests, at which case goodbye exhaustion. Yeah, exactly. But if you're, if you're in the middle of a dungeon or halfway out in the middle of nowhere, and yeah. maybe you're, you know, it's a busy day in quotes you're having a lot of combat mm. one or two levels of exhaustion is suddenly a lot harder to get rid of and that's it's that rubber banding of time dilation that is exactly, quite yeah. prevalent that that really changes it from oh my god this is going to cripple my class for the next five sessions yeah to, oh it's already gone i've yeah. forgotten about it <laughs> and going on that as well actually even taking it out of a combat scenario let's say you've suffered exhaustion for saving a town yeah Mm -hmm. and the leader of the town the local law master the mayor whatever the gm decides to call them has invited you to a dinner in your honor and you're currently failing on two exhaustion Mm -hmm. and you're the face character let's say 
Mm-hmm. You're rolling at disadvantage for all of your persuasion, all of your charm, or everything that you are used to being so good at. Mm. You're now bad at. I mean, honestly, it's one of the things I love to do to like bards more so than any, <laughs> because bards get so many skills. I mean, the only class that gets more skills than them is a rogue, but they tend to focus more on the deck skill, so it doesn't really worry too much about like, yeah. can I seduce the dragon? Let's say the classic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So dropping an exhaustion on a bard make them roll disadvantage on persuasion. I thought that was a smart idea until my bard player realised that as a College of Eloquence bard, she can't roll less than a 10 on persuasion. Yeah. So that ruined that plan. I need to come up with something else. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, on one hand, I like the interesting decisions, but on the other hand, I also like, because there's there's other, I think rogues get something similar where they can't roll less than a 10 on on something as well, which are quite nice. It's probably stealth or acrobatics. Mm Mm-hmm. Something like that. Yeah. Or maybe it's a, a save. Maybe it's a deck save or something like that. Mm. They can just default it to a 10, which is quite smart. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I've been fortunate enough never to really suffer from exhaustion in a way that wasn't like, oh, you've been fighting so hard. You've been fighting for a day. You've mm. got exhaustion. Oh, well, we're at the end of the day anyway, so I'll just sleep off. Like, yeah. I've never had to really, as a player, deal with it too much. But I've got a question for you. Okay. Which is, talking of fighting energy and talking of dropping to zero HP in the middle of a fight, Yeah, it's a bit fourth wall breaking, it's a bit um, suspension of disbelief breaking when, say, you've got the barbarian who's just been, well, let me put it another way, say you've got the paladin who has just been at the front of the fight and has just been getting stomped on and whomped on by yeah that 60 points of damage oof the rest of the party recoil in terror because that would have killed them and boom takes another 30 damage oh everyone's wince him eventually they go down they hit yeah. zero and everyone's like, oh my gosh you know like they've just been beaten to a pulp somebody can almost trip and fall and just like touch them with a cure wounds and they're back up again at, you know 100 percent fighting prowess yeah. and capacity so that is even for me you know when when you when i put it in such a obviously somewhat cynical uh, example like that it, it sounds a bit it, silly it does it, it does sort of i know it's a fantasy game so there is a mm-hmm. level of suspension of disbelief but there has to be a level of realism to it as well otherwise the threat doesn't feel real mhm and then obviously that like yeah i get it it's it's, it's a tricky situation for designers mm. i'm not a game designer i don't i'm not i haven't got a and you know i'm not about to wow everybody with a a completely robust alternative solution no of course not what that does lead to though is like a yo-yo effect especially in parties that aren't maybe um they're still kind of learning each other learning a dynamic learning how the game works so yeah. it leads to someone's down i better heal them I'll shout a healing word at them from across the room. And they're back up. Yeah, Paladin stands back up at maybe like 7 HP, depending <laughs> on the, you know. And then, oh, I'm still standing right underneath this basilisk. Stomp for 30 damage. Well, okay, you, you've kind of wasted yeah. two turns in, in that. You've, you've wasted the healing word bonus action. And also maybe the, to a certain extent, maybe the death saving roll on the Pally. Yeah. Maybe he could have rolled a, you know, higher than 10 and done it for free exactly yeah you never know because you might roll a nat 20 i mean i know it's only a one in 20 chance or a five percent mm-hmm. chance but there is always the chance that you'll roll a nat 20 and just get back up with one hit point mm-hmm. yeah that i find less I, i'm more attracted to the idea of just rolling a 20 and just standing back up because it's like an you know and it's an adrenaline rush yeah it's like a heroic feat of oh i can do this all day like <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> rather than just someone going get well soon across the room and they just yeah. stand up again like huh what <laughs> exactly yeah. it's like what happened there <laughs> i guess i'm alive now hmm. so there are there are i've seen people suggest alternative rules for like to try and make dropping to zero be a bit of a bigger deal exactly yeah because i i know that i played i played on one off level 20 campaign and everybody was just a bit baffled by their classes hmm. i was i think i was a cleric at that point and just diving in, I think maybe the first or second time playing a cleric, diving in at level 20, I was like, oh, whoa, what the hell is going on here? Uh, so there, there was a yo-yo a couple times of, I'll cast Cure Wounds at level 3, maybe? Oh, that's healed 15. Great, yeah. but the Paladin's got 170 HP, so it's kind of worthless to a certain extent. And then Stomp, he's down again. So yeah. People have thought about alternatives to getting knocked down to zero HP, and I just wondered what 
if you'd heard of them, what your thoughts are. Are there any ways to maybe increase the impact, but not so much that it makes it essentially a game over? I mean, one I quite like to run in the games, and obviously when it comes down to it, a lot of these are homebrew rules that the party or the players mm-hmm. come up with and agree at the table. So using the Nat 20 get back up again, mm-hmm. they're fine. They are up. Their natural instincts have driven them to recover and they're standing again. It's their turn. Yeah. That said, if it's a situation with like someone dumps a healing potion and an unconscious person, I've actually said if someone is unconscious, you can't make them drink a healing potion because they will drown. Mm, see that? I'm going I'm going to jump in here because I, I talked on a previous episode about everybody using bonus actions to drink potions even yeah. so much as to show it's even a, a bonus action to feed a potion to somebody else who's down mm. and and you're swinging the pendulum the other way to say you can't even do it with an action which is which is really interesting and i'm probably more aligned with your train of thought than i am the commonplace practice of bonus action potions for that precise reason it you're in the middle of a fight right you're yeah. not about to like p- p- pop their head up on a pillow mm. be like they're there come on let, let's you know have your medicine put it on a little teaspoon and, and feed it into their mouth you know you don't <laughs> yeah <laughs> just yeet the glass at their face and be like get up <laughs> oh what i have said with the party is you can't feed it to them you can mm-hmm. pour it over them it will have a lesser effect but it Ooh. will still heal them so you know how a basic healing potion does 2d4 plus 2 hit points yeah it now just does 2d4 you lose Ooh. that bonus hmm. and that's just carte blanche across all healing potions you lose that bonus on an unconscious person because it's got to get wow. into their system via their skin basically yes yeah. or like through the wound so it loses some of that potency but at least they've got hit points that's one I hadn't heard of. I really like that one, though. It's interesting, mm. a different a different approach. And on the bonus action potion thing, I actually do run that in the campaign, so you can use a bonus action to take a potion. Mm-hmm. But I also mitigate it to an extent. I have all-player starter packs, so adventuring starter packs in mm-hmm. my campaigns, have what I call a potion prepare pack. Ooh. So they can prepare, like a caster would prepare spells, they can prepare up to three potions poisons oils that kind of thing Mm -hmm. and to use one of those in the middle of combat is a bonus action not an action Mm -hmm. but if they want to use something that's not one of those three it takes an action Uh uh-huh so it's a way of keeping the combat flowing because when i first played dungeons and dragons and we are going back about 12 years Mm -hmm. at this point um when i used to play dungeons and dragons 1e with my friends in college it used to really bother me because I was the front line fighter. I was all uh, I either played fighter, ranger, or paladin in one e, mm-hmm. and it was always me taking the hits. And it was like I have to keep attacking, they have to keep healing me, or I have to take a healing potion. And I couldn't take the healing potion and attack, so it just made me feel like right. I have to keep attacking, and it, I wound up killing off two characters because I had to do that mm. because the cleric just wasn't healing me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 lossy for the front line to do it because you've lost mm. a turn of attacking, and of course you're not taking damage if everybody's dead. So exactly, all the enemies are dead. So mm. it's it's a lossy process. You might heal yourself for ten, but then you've sacrificed a turn of getting. Maybe there'll be another round of getting hit for eleven. So you've got a net loss of one HP still. So it's yeah. But in regard with using the healing potion or using healing word or cure wounds, I like to think of those in terms of combat as uh, a defibrillator or Mm -hmm. uh, an EpiPen for someone who's going into shock. Mm -hmm. So it's that sudden kick of adrenaline to their system to get their heart pumping, get them better, get them on their feet, get them back in the fight. But when the fight is over, that character does get a point of exhaustion. Oh, there we go. There's the juice, right? Mm. But if they get themselves back up, say with a nat 20, they Mm -hmm. don't have exhaustion. Or right. if they stabilise through death saves or are stabilised first before the cure wounds, mm-hmm. they don't. So I like to force my players to really think about their actions, what the consequences are going to be. Is it worth making this rash decision now? Because later it might really impact us. That is, again, not one I've heard of, but is a really interesting, adds, adds a slight layer of complexity, but mm. the complexity comes from the players having to make that call of, okay, let's just get them up now, and that's a problem for future me, is exhaustion. Let's, let, yeah. let, let the future party worry about that. Or is it a case of waste an action, 
trying to stabilize now and, and then, then another turn yeah but then not having to worry about that in the future ooh ooh ooh, ooh. that is one i'm going to write down uh, and and think about introducing as a, as another dimension there cuz it was a loaded question as you might have mm. guessed because i'm also like just standing back up as it's a bit trivial and I've, you know, I've yeah. got a druid in the party who's very keen on just dropping healing word and bish, bash, bosh, everyone's up again. And it's a bit like, come on, there's a, there's a bit more gravitas to what you, you've saved someone's life there. That isn't just mm. a get up. Okay, fine. Whatever. No one cares. No one bats an eyelid. And I, I felt like there needed to be a bit more gravitas to be like, nah, he, he was going to die. Like, yeah, he was on death's door. Yeah. 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 I know it's only like a 49% chance or whatever, but I wouldn't bet on those odds. <laughs> no, absolutely not. If I've got those odds, give me a DNAR. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, ward humour. Hello, Danilo in post-production here with a couple of announcements. First, this episode you're currently listening to is the finale of Season 1. 25 episodes seemed like as good a number as any. So, that means next week will be a special wrap-up and retrospective featuring a few special segments, including a Q&A. If you have any questions about me, the podcast, my campaign, or anything else really, please let me know through the usual social links, and I shall be answering them next week. Secondly, I am running a little competition just for the listeners. The prize is a care package from Game Tea, a UK purveyor of TTRPG goods. It will include a scented candle, pin badge of your chosen 5e class, and either a DM or player journal. For a chance to win, all you need to do is message me on any platform saying that you want to enter the competition. The winner will be decided at random and announced during next week's show. And that's it. Without any further ado, back to the show. But no, on Healing Words and everything, I completely get that. I mean, in the 5e campaign I've got, the Paladin has dropped to zero hit points about three times. Mm. Purely by his own hubris, more than anything else. I mean, he's a halfling Paladin who thinks awesome. he can sneak. Oh, clonking around in plate armour. Yeah. yeah, and one of my favourite parts that's happened so far, I mean... The character is played by my older brother, who, like me, likes to build wrecked characters. <laughs> like, his paladin has charisma score of 10. Wow. So his okay, casting brave. is useless. Yeah. With the exception of, like, a few spells. He's basically reduced his spell list to only the barest healing spells mm -hmm. and spells that don't require a DC save. Yeah. Because it's the only way he's getting anywhere. Yeah. And because of that, he's more like... He's more like a holy fighter. So he's got some of the holy abilities, mm -hmm. like the Divine Smite and everything, which doesn't need the charisma. Mm -hmm. But he's much more focused on like getting into combat, getting in melee, keeping the party safe, really protector role. Mm -hmm. So because of that, he winds up getting dropped the most. So of the party, he's suffered the most exhaustion. Right. Which... Just has been quite good for some like really fun player interaction bits because he was actually exhausted going into a boss fight they were going to have. So his plan was that him and the sorcerer were going to stay outside the city lines and just throw things in with this archery battalion they had. And mm -hmm. because obviously being a halfling, he only has a speed of 25, when the actual boss fight happened, it was just the bard and the barbarian inside trying to masquerade as lizard folk. Uh -huh. that went wrong because the yeah. sorcerer dropped a fireball on them mm -hmm. usually happens mm -hmm. and by the end of the boss fight because of his exhaustion he actually didn't get a single attack off oh the sorcerer the barbarian the bard had already dealt with it to the point where the barbarian became the party healer for a turn <laughs> right okay because the bard got to zero hit points and he just dumped a healing potion down her throat. Yeah. Or like poured it over her. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I think exhaustion, if it's used right by both the GM and the players, and it does require the players to really role play it. Because mm. this is exhaustion. This isn't just, oh, I'm feeling a bit tired. Oh, I didn't get to sleep last night. Oh, I didn't have a cup of coffee this morning. That's not <laughs> exhaustion. No. 
if as a person you've never actually felt exhaustion, it's very difficult to explain it. Hmm. And I've only felt it recently with working on a very busy COVID ward in the height of the pandemic in Britain. Mm -hmm. You feel like your bones are breaking under you with exhaustion. And it's really down to the players to roleplay that properly. Mm. I think if you frame it within D&D, which is the example we're using right now, Mm. of like these guys are otherwise crazy heroes of the realm right they can tackle liches and demons and and dragons and stuff yeah so if they're if they are exhausted it's pretty flipping bad at that Mm. point right if 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 otherwise they're leaping from battlement to battlement to grapple a flying dragon and shooting meteors from their hands exactly they're feeling tired then it must be pretty darn tired (laughs) yeah exactly it isn't just like oh oof tossing and turning last night oh, feel a bit rough this morning <laughs> yeah it, it's like nah the, the, you you have a health problem funnily enough yeah and it's not one that can be cured with like cure disease or cure wounds mm. i think the only spell that can actually help with exhaustion is um restoration yes yeah i can't remember if it's lesser or greater but yeah i, I yeah that sounds right to me yeah and that's actually quite a high spell slot for dealing with something that most people would go, oh, I'm just getting disadvantage on my ability checks. Oh, well, now I'm just rolling disadvantage on my saves. I'll be fine. And by the time mm. you're at three, there's no way a low-level druid or cleric or bard is going to have enough spell slots to actually heal that. Mm-hmm. It's something you've almost got to deal with there and then, or it's going to get worse. So I've just I've just brought it up, actually, and... It actually has to be greater restoration for oh. a start of a 10. So uh, Lesser doesn't do exhaustion explicitly. It only yeah. does a few like poisoned and so on and so on. And greater does all of the above plus exhaustion level by one as well. Yeah. So if you've got more than one. So it that is a really, now we've put it in plain paper. That's a really interesting case of, so it's a fifth level spell to do one level of exhaustion or and this is a direct parallel to a benefit or mm. a long rest and a, and a hearty yeah. meal will mm. have the same effect, which is weird. I, I can't think of another example in the game where there's such a one-to-one parallel between a, you know, a spell and mm. a non-spell effect that will have the same result. Mm-hmm. But I guess the problem there is that the spell is instantaneous. Yes. Whereas yeah, the long it, rest, you lose a day, you lose eight hours. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Again, but that con- you know, campaign sensitive, right? It's it that mm. could mean the world, or it could mean very exactly. little. I must admit, it's only a hundred GP, so it's not breaking the bank probably for adventurers that throw around level, fifth yeah. level spells. Yeah, but it's it's still an interesting thought process there to be like, mm. you know, I, I mean, the curse. Other things, greater restoration does is cursed mm. a reduction to an ability score, which is a pretty big deal. Yeah, or reducing hit points, charmed or petrified, which again, a uh, charmed not as big, but petrified is obviously a game. That's a game ender. A, 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 yeah, a game over. You know, especially yeah. if you can hit basilisks at say level three or four, you, mm. you, you're screwed without greater restoration. So, um, so yeah, that, that it does. You know, it's a powerful spell, and it is. I think that's why there's so much talk around exhaustion. Of you could throw it out like a, a more two dimensional solution to the one you propose is. Mm. If someone goes down to zero hit points, they have a level of exhaustion. Yeah. You know, simple binary. Yeah, exactly. You hit zero hit points. Next time you get up, regardless of how it is, mm. you've got a level of exhaustion. Exactly. But then when you say the payment of that is a fifth level spell of 100 gold that is consumed, I might add. So it's 100 gold every time. Yeah. That can quickly add up, especially if you've got yo-yoing. They stand up, yeah. they get knocked, they go back down. Okay, well, that's now two, 200 gold or two two casts of greater, <laughs> greater exactly. restoration. I mean, actually going back to the subject we actually said at the start with the um, Barbarian Zealot, mm-hmm. Barbarian Zealot does basically fall in line with that a lot nicer because of the whole raised dead thing, where they yeah. can just be brought back. And I'm now really not sure whether it's probably exhaustion to that, because technically they're being raised by both whoever is using the raised dead, but they're also having their gods input as well, aren't they? Mm-hmm. I see what you're getting at, because in that case, it is a do not resuscitate. It is a, do you know what? It's actually better if I die here. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can just ask my god and get us yeah. back on track 
after the fight. In that situation, I don't think you should apply because that's basically like divine. That is like a cleric's divine intervention in that situation because the gods actively getting involved mm-hmm. to bring that zealot back. Yeah, to say, don't worry, I'm providing the material components. Like yeah. I'm, I'm meeting you halfway here, so in yeah. that, I would agree that in that instance, no, they wouldn't have a level of exhaustion because it is a divine interference to a certain extent mm. to bridge that gap. At which case, it is like I'd rather just die and then someone stab me if I go yeah. down <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah, cast I'll that ca- second level spell. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll spend some time with my god. No worries, we, we need to catch up anyway, and yeah. then it'll, it'll pat me on the backside, and I'll be I'll be good to go. <laughs> and in that situation, it's like a cheaper version of commune as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which I think is like a cleric fourth level spell. <laughs> I do. I like. I haven't. I have in my head. And again, this is how it be. There's an episode of Simpsons where Homer, you know, he's he's up in heaven and he's sitting next yes. to God, and he and they're on the the throne, and Homer's just like, oh, all right. They just have a, like a chat. It isn't like yeah. a a huge deal it isn't like tell me all the secrets of the universe it isn't no a, a bruce almighty situation it's just like oh you're right yeah yeah not too bad not too bad you're good well i'm feeling a bit down at the moment because you know my friends are fighting down there yeah mm. do you want to get back to it do you know what yeah if you could that'd be great all right yeah cheers see you later mate uh <laughs> i mean that is such a good episode in of itself because mm. i've recently been re-watching since because hey it's all on disney plus now Yes, yeah. But that is genuinely a good episode, because it, it does make you ask a few questions about, like, is God in church and da-da-da-da-da? Yeah. But then actually relaying that into d and I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fantastic, because I've got so many really religious characters in my campaigns at the moment. Yeah. Because, I mean, I've got a cleric of a homebrew god um, who's basically... Uh, I've nicknamed him the god of nature and cruelty. So wow, that should okay. tell you about what that kind of god is. Mm-hmm. But then I've got the rogue is now a devotee of Helm, and the wizard has got like Bane watching over her because her family <laughs> is directly connected to the dark god Bane. Oh, yes. <laughs> Which is hilarious. So when they're going, he's an evil god, he's a bad god, and then he actually turns up and they're all like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I like bringing the gods into it, especially and with the healing, because with D and D, healing and the gods is directly connected. It's yes, a bit of a pet peeve of mine personally, because the first time I ever played healer, it was in a campaign where the healing was science, it was medicine, mm-hmm. and that was just a hilarious situation how that even started. Because I was originally the front line fighter of the party, mm. and it was a campaign where time travel was a thing. So the entire party is down. They're all dying. No, no one has any healing. I'm the only one conscious. And I go, I am going to time travel 20 years in the past, get my medical doctorate and all the medical supplies I need and come back when I'm 10 years older. <laughs> right. And from that point on, that just changed the trajectory of not just that character, because he went from being like an accountant who was also good with swords to being... Basically, Frankenstein mixed with Dracula. Mm. And that was then what started me mostly playing healers. And I kind of just do it all the time now. Like, as a mainline, I will go, okay, what's mm. the healer variant? Right, I'm having that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think with artificers, I think they, you could, there's an argument there to say they can heal without. I'm, mm. I'm fairly certain they get cure wounds. And I'm, they do. I'm fairly certain there's an argument there to say they, they may be curing without divine interaction. Because they're more like arcanists, like wizards, warlocks, sorcerers, yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, wizards also don't have a religious aspect, but I don't mm-hmm. think they get any healing spells. So They get one, and this is a really cool spell, and actually this is one I only found out recently. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like a fourth level spell mm-hmm. where they sacrifice 3d8 of their own hit points and give double that to someone else. Now, I think my cl- I think the cleric in my game has that. Mm. Yeah, a transference, something like that. Yeah, it's like uh, health transference, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Excuse, excuse us, listeners, while we rapidly type on. Uh... <laughs> oh god, yeah, I've got my tablet ready. I'm straight onto wiki dot. <laughs> yeah, here you go. I've got life transference, That's third level. Uh, it is. Yeah, you're right, cleric and wizard. Yeah, that um, is mad. You take forty eight necrotic damage, which can't be reduced. <sighs> Uh, and one creature of your choice within range regains hit points equal to twice that damage. Oh, 
See, I thought it wasn't as bad as 4d8. Mm. And then you can up it as well. Yes, you can upcast it, yeah, if you want to push that oh, push that God. envelope. So yeah, the cleric has told me, you know, out of character, he's like, that is my... I, I'm going to go Nova in my healing, essentially, and, and if I have to, then I will Yeah, I, I will push that envelope and go right to the limit of what, what's possible. Um, I did not know that was a wizard spell as well. That is interesting. Mm. I only found that out recently, yeah. yeah f- fitting thematically as well to say, like, it's a necromancy school, right? So they've mm. they've had to learn some some naughty boy spells, yeah, and then and, and secrets to be able to uh, <laughs> to pull that one off. Ooh, yeah, interesting. Of course, my 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 cleric in the campaign is a uh, death domain and Merkel is their deity, oh, nice. so that again makes you know all, all the lines there. Oh yeah. The only other one I was thinking about is bards. Now, oh yeah, I know that they're like, I guess they, again they get cure wounds at the very least, mm. healing word. Yeah, and again they're their magic comes from the weave and from yeah it's from creation itself isn't it <laughs> yeah and like just from magic that's innate in in the world so I, uh, you could argue that both ways but you, you could say that their theirs isn't also ne- necessarily a one-to-one no it's not it's not directly connected and technically speaking you could say that with druids actually because they're not connected to a deity they're connected to nature itself but then isn't i mean again yeah. same dependent but isn't nine times out of ten nature itself and quotes basically represented by a god some some higher yeah. power again if your campaign or, or saying you know it doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be but i think mainly whether it's like sylvanus or mm. somebody else or whatever i mean if clerics can have the whole oath of like nature then those are definitely nature gods that a druid could worship mm. yeah <sighs> yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting it's an interesting one and i'm not super qualified to talk about like religion and the impact no, no. of religion and then all that kind of stuff but in, obviously all this has been framed within dungeons and dragons and exactly it's, yeah it's, 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 it's an interesting one discussion to have and opens a lot more of a pandora's box than <laughs> yeah than, than you really than, want to then frankly and thankfully we have enough time to talk about today <laughs> yeah because that would just uh, that i think that would have to be a whole nother conversation with someone much yeah. more qualified than me <laughs> yeah yes yeah, so, likewise for myself um but that's always been my only bugbear with Dungeons and Dragons, where there isn't like a science healer, like it, it, like there's mm. no magic whatsoever. Mm. But then again, it just doesn't work within the mechanics. To be fair, no. You would have to have like it would be like almost like a fighter subclass, almost like maybe like a, a battle medic. Yeah, and I know the bannerist actually gets something where they can where basically when they use their uh, second wind. They can actually give some healing to anyone around them, mm-hmm. but like imagine that, but like as an actual battle medic, like frontline healer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a. Uh, I took. I don't know what it is, but I've talked about Gloomhaven, a board game, a lot recently. Oh yeah, and um, it's probably because I'm missing it more, and and obviously the the hope that we can start playing it again soon here in the UK. Fair. Um, but there's a, and this is an official spoiler warning for a Gloomhaven class that isn't unlocked in the first six. Consider that your warning, oh. everybody. I'm, I'm presuming you're okay with me talking about oh, this. Oh yeah, God, not. yeah. Okay, cool. There's a there's a class that's uh, indicated by the saw icon, and you'll unlock it later on. And it's it is basically like he's a he, he's a human in the universe for starters, which immediately puts them on a little bit of a back foot mm. in regards to weird and wonderful other bits that are going on. Yeah, and he is a proper like the art. And the fluff is proper like battle medic. So he's literally like, my weapon's a sawbone, like a, <sighs> but I use that for healing as well as damaging. <laughs> and it's it's all the theme and all the fluff and all the flavor is around like somewhat brutal battle medicine of like, yeah. I'm just going to snap your bones back together and you're just going to have to grin and bear it. Yeah, battlefield triage. <laughs> yeah, ex- precisely. Here's just yeah. a syringe of God knows what. It's either going to hurt the enemy or heal you 50 50. <laughs> We're just going <laughs> to. We're just going to deal with it. And, you know, like he's just carrying bloodied rags in the artwork. Yeah. And he looks knackered, funnily enough. <laughs> and that just maybe, you know, talking of like a battle medic, just made me think of that. And that was a really good artistic interpretation, I mm. like, of that person who's just like weary because with one hand they're having to fight back abominations and the other yeah. they're having to apply splints. And. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, yeah, that would be. It was yeah, it's, it's a good interpretation. I'm, I'm sure probably someone has homebrewed oh, definitely. all the all the Gloomhaven glasses into into D and D. Oh god, it's so popular as a system and just as a game, it looks so good. I mm. can't wait to like have like games 
back home, like with everyone around the table, and yeah. actually get it, to be honest. Cause I've been looking at it for so long as getting it because it looks so good. Oh man, it's fantastic! Yeah, and it was—it was, we 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 had a really nice routine of like every other Friday. I you don't know what you have until it's gone. Yeah, and I didn't realize quite how cathartic it was. You know, literally like clocking off work. These are my colleagues as well as playing with, so we'd all clock off at work at a similar time, mm. bolt round to mine, and you know just shoot the shit, get some KFC in, yeah, and just you know eat garbage. You know, play Gleamhaven for for five hours. You know, rant about work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, usual. It- it's just a good way of dealing with it. And to be honest, with my own YouTube videos, people have actually asked me why I don't live stream like so many other people that do recorded sessions on YouTube and things, because most of them are yeah. via Twitch or some other live streaming service. It's because this is my friend group. This isn't like something I'm doing as a job. This mm. is our weekly or every other weekly game. And there's quite a lot of times we'll just have like a five, ten minute break and just bitch and moan about work and family and <laughs> yeah and i just have to go through every week and cut that out <laughs> yeah yeah F- funnily enough uh, a guest that i was recording with recently he asked the same question to me he's like oh your main game that you referenced in the episodes the one that i've referenced this episode he's like do you do you stream that do you twitch it and i said do you know what no and i don't think it, mm. it would because it is again their colleagues and friends more, yeah. more friends than they are colleagues at this point and it is it, it serves a very specific purpose that would you know not be ruined but yeah it it would change the dynamic i guess it's a better way to put it absolutely now to those listening this might have sounded like a huge off track however i'm going to definitely bring us back onto my last topic i had awesome which was uh mental health boom Ah. how how smooth a transition is that eh? oh best ever (laughs) so (laughs) it's it's a topic i talked about briefly with my friend simon on our episode on happiness Mm. and obviously we've talked about the mechanical stuff quite a lot but i I just wanted to talk about a little bit on obviously it's been trying times for everybody absolutely and i know that the funnily enough the dnd game that we i do play in and and i stream in has been an outlet Mm. Uh, you know it's it's i always look forward to games that's the nature of the game however I, i do have to say I've started to look forward to them more since being stuck in four walls for a It's year. that socialization, isn't it? It's that mm-hmm. interaction with other people that we aren't getting as much as we used to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's it's just, it's been slightly different. I, it's really hard for me to articulate. And mm. I'm, I, again, it, this is a topic I'm in no way qualified to really give it the, the, the weight and the, Absolutely, the, yeah. the imp- impetus it deserves. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is it's, you know, playing D and D and and playing TTRPGs is probably something that a lot of people can resonate with. It has really been this savior of my, you know, mental health. I yeah. suppose over the last twelve months, it's been this. When are we playing next, boys? Saturday, good. I'm gonna settle down in front of my computer, webcam on, get some snackies in. Exactly. And, yeah, shoot the shit for for five hours and just have a blast. And it's the exact same over here because my main group, the one that you might see in the Travis of Lace Spark videos, we've been playing over Zoom, uh, Messenger, Discord. We've been playing that way for about five years now. Mm. We've always done that because two of the main players, Chris and Nick, uh, Nick's Dara is a demented DM, uh, who I tweeted you about. Mm-hmm. They both live in Rugby, which is about 20 miles from where I live. Mm-hmm. And that's a bit too far for us to go every week mm. for a game that lasts about three, four hours. Yep. And we did kind of peter off with the role-playing games after our last campaign. We were looking for something new. Uh, me and Nick are the usual DMs, uh, so we were just like bouncing ideas off each other about who wants to play what, who does which, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. And then the lockdown happened, and it was like, okay, we need to get back into this. We need to get mm. more of this, because this is our only... For a lot of us, this is our only socialization. Mm. And it just keeps that... It just keeps your sanity. It just keep, it almost like keeps that hope alive with everything that's been going on. And that's really important at the moment. I mean, hopefully, touch wood, we're coming towards the end of it now. Mm-hmm. But so many people have suffered so badly. And yeah. people who already had mental health disorders and illnesses are feeling it really badly. And I know loads of people who have those problems and are known to the hospital are 
almost feeling worse because they're being overlooked for the people who were previously, massive quotation marks, healthy, Mm -hmm. who are now starting to develop depression, anxiety, uh, phobias, that kind of thing. So there's this whole problem with, like, who needs the attention first? Is it the people who have these conditions arising now? Or is it the people who've had it for longer? Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, TTRPGs, games nights... Um, I know like loads of people do those like family quizzes over Zoom. Yes. I think yeah. it's kept a lot of people better than mm-hmm. they might have done if it was a complete isolation. Mm-hmm. I-, I am exceptionally lucky with the situation I found myself. I'm not going into too much details mm. relative to you know the, the unfortunate positions a lot of people have found yeah. themselves in. I-, I am infinitely fortunate and-, and lucky. But I think we have to all consider ourselves lucky that we live in a time where we can have those remote meetings. We can have those remote discussions. I can walk my mum around the garden in, on, on webcam with my laptop out. Like, exactly. <laughs> so, so she can identify plants for me that have grown up in spring. That's oh, uh, <laughs> that's really nice, actually. Yeah, I'm like, well, what are these? All these plants that have grown up in the last couple of weeks? She's like, well, that's a buttercup. That's a <laughs> that's a tulip. And I'm like, oh, thanks. Oh, I've got a really nice garden. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, if we didn't have the technology that we have now. Mm. I've heard loads of people relate what's happened to, like, the Blitz during World War Two, mm-hmm. And it's like, it's not, though, because at least we can still see and talk to each other, and we still have that interaction, which, like, you've still got that really lovely thing with your mum, mm-hmm. we've still got our games. I mean, it's been awful for my wife, because she actually works from home. Mm-hmm. So her socialising and her interaction while I was at work was going out into town, going to the shops, that kind of thing. Yeah, and she's not had that for over a year, so her mental health has really dropped off badly. And it is thanks to TTRPGs we've managed to actually keep a level of interaction with the outside world. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably, if I'm being truly honest to myself, it's probably one of the reasons that I started the podcast was mm. to meet new people and and talk to new people and have that that excitement that you get when you would normally go out and maybe you're at a bar and you're talking to people and you're making friends and clubs yeah. and stuff and that you don't you know we're just not getting anymore i've i've kind of backfilled with the with the podcast and a, mm. and i gotta say well that's served its purpose better than i could ever have hoped <laughs> absolutely i mean it, this is this is probably the most i've spoken to anyone new besides people i'm looking after in the hospital mm-hmm. and it is great being able to still go to the hospital because obviously with me I'm still getting that socialisation but yeah. everyone turning up they're all there for a reason, they're all there because they're ill and you're there to look after them this is nice because this is actually talking about a hobby, something I'm passionate about mm-hmm. and it's exciting Ah, good that fills my heart because it means that it's, you know, we've, we've had a, I've been able to help somebody else at least yeah. as well as myself so, uh, well on that wholesome note is there anything about health that uh, we might have missed or you wanted to, to talk about? I think we went over everything because I, I, everything we went over about exhaustion and the use of healing potions and using different homebrew methods to up the threat to the mm-hmm. players. I think that is important because they are basically mad demigods with the attitudes of kleptomaniac children at the end of the day. <laughs> yep. And I mean that about every player character, especially myself when I'm a player character. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> It's very easy to forget how powerful you are relative to the the commoner, oh, yeah. isn't it? It's especially as soon as you hit like tier two onwards. Mm. I, I find myself routinely having to to be like recently on one anecdote is my players have got a couple of them have got access to the fly spell. Oh god! So they're like, oh, I'm just going to hop back to town. I'm just going to fly back. Yeah. And then even when they're doing it, I'm like, okay, you were supermanning across a mining town mm. full of miners, like you know blue collar workers in this universe they're not going to react well yeah i'm like this is you know they they've already shot arrows at you when you were doing it before like (laughs) and it's just so easy when you're when you're occupying that character's worldview to forget how godlike as Mm. you said you can be i'm like you're flying this is this is this is insane like this is wild to these guys it's Mm. it's it's outlandish it's unheard of they are people. <laughs> <laughs> like if I if I look out my, my office window, if I look out my office window now and saw someone flying by, I'd be like, "Well, it's the end times." 
yeah, did I was I drinking last night? Um, am I <laughs> am I drinking now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, so at time of recording, it's eleven twenty, so that would be yeah. just the concern there, yeah, like just a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 it, absolutely that re that reinforcement of like, guys, you are yeah. special for lack of a better term. You are empowered here and with great. Ugh, with great, power, yeah. <laughs> with great power, with great power comes great responsibility. I mean, one phrase my party have started throwing at me is, "I'm the kind of games master where no good deed goes unpunished." <laughs> and I kind of set that in motion so they didn't start doing the stuff that re- I really should punish them for. <laughs> I mean, just one thing that's turned up at the moment in the Wizard Zero session, she had the chance to coup de gras a kobold. Mm-hmm. Now, most player characters, they'll just do that and think nothing of it. Mm-hmm. She's playing a proper cutie pie character who just thinks everyone is lovely and she wants, like, a lo- load of pet squirrels. Yeah. It's like Disney princess in this mm. dark and gritty war story. It's fantastic. <laughs> so yep. she didn't kill the kobold. Well, that kobold has reappeared now in the campaign as an adult blue dragon. Oh, Good. Yeah. Okay. Who is loyal to the party because they 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 helped him and helped the cobalt people, mm-hmm. but now they have a giant blue dragon that is walking around their town running a cobalt postal service, <laughs> who has brought with him an adult black dragon. Oh, who uh-huh. the party have defined as an asshole. Oh man, that's a boiling pot. I know. A boiling pot. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's been so much fun just to watch them all freak out. <laughs> ah, well, I look I look forward to hearing about that. Uh, the, yeah, the, the fallout of that one. All right, well, thank you so much, Cal, on this very, very interesting and expressive and expansive topic. It's been so much fun. Yeah, it has. Really good. A little Saturday morning, good vibes, mm. hopefully. Yeah, Great for, start for to the, the weekend. Parents. Indeed. Is there anything you would like to plug? Well, my hopefully by the time this comes out, I'll have actually broken the 500 follower limit on Twitter, which is kind of my goal at the moment. Uh, awesome. Just going to get more videos out there. So if any of your listeners would like to watch two different campaigns, one of which is The Travels of Lace Spark, which is uh, very serious, very pretty. It's actually a D&D advanced first edition campaign. Wow going all the way back to retro. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is my Archipelago of Dragons campaign. It's all set in the same world, but about 100 years apart. Okay. Because what I've told the party is that it, the one party, their interactions and their actions will shape the world for the next 200, 500,000 mm. years. And their actions are what causes it to go from first edition into fifth edition, almost like the release of more magic into the world. Mm. Interesting. Okay. But if I know there's like thousands of those kind of recordings online, so if people would actually like to come and actually listen to me just talk about Dungeons & Dragons stuff a bit like jokey, five, ten minute recordings myself, or watch me and my friends play board games, because that's something else I do, Mm -hmm. it'd be fantastic if they'd like to jump over to Baron's Party Plays on YouTube. Awesome. And as usual, all the links to everything uh, Carl's just mentioned will be in the episode description. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you everyone at home for listening. It's been a bit of a, a bit of a wild ride. So uh, yeah, thank you all for listening. As usual, catch me on all the socials. Otherwise, thank you and good night. <laughs>